Hello everybody, welcome back. Tommy Los Angeles here. Today is July 23rd, 2021. I'm really excited to make this video about Canto number 12 of Purgatorio. Trying, I'll try to explain what's uh, between the lines, etc. I'm more excited than usual about this canto because, for good reasons, it's a, a, a special canto for me. It's the closing canto of this triptych of three cantos about uh, pride and humility, canto 10, 11, and 12. And we see Dante's powers at their majestic peak, uh, unsurpassable. It's almost like seeing Michael Jordan in 1989 or 1990. And he explains to us again and again uh, what pride is and what kind of poison for our soul uh, pride actually is. Even if uh, we think we understand it, we probably don't, to be honest. I'm, I'll speak for myself only, but this is my fourth reread of the entire Divine Comedy. And uh, I am uh, every single time surprised by how much the negative stuff that Dante is talking about, especially the lack of humility and the examples, the negative examples, um, are reflected in my day-to-day -day life. So I have a lot to learn. Uh, from Dante every single time I reread it. The canto opens with this beautiful and uh, biblical image of the oxen. It's a reference from the Gospel, of course, uh, for my yoke is easy and my burden light. That's the Gospel of Matthew. As oxen yoked proceed abreast, so I moved with that burden soul. He's still talking about Oderisi, the famous miniaturist from the previous canto. As long as my kind pedagogue allowed me to. The expression winds and oars is actually a literal translation from uh, Dante Italian ali con l'ali e coi remi. However, uh, maybe a better translation, some commentators have said, could be with sails and oars, because the metaphor is consistent with the sailing life rather than wings and oars, which is a mixed metaphor and maybe doesn't work as well. The recommendation that comes from Virgil, it's a very interesting one, because um, he says each urge his boat along with all his force. He's not simply telling Dante, let's go, we have to go, but he is making a theological point. And uh, I've, I found a really insightful uh, comment about this point in uh, this book that I presented in my last uh, video, Spiritual Direction from Dante by Father Paul Pearson. So let me read it to you. Um, about this specific uh, passage. Father Pearson says, even though we are being taught the Christian lesson of the connection with one another in the bonds of compassion and charity, that does not mean that we should delay our own progress. Um, we are called to make our way to heaven as quickly as we can. Oderisi has been charitable in answering Dante's questions. However, his reason for being here on the mountain is to get through these purgations, this purification, and arrive at paradise. At the same time, so does Dante. He has, Dante has his own goals. They each have their own work to do, and although they will support each other and cooperate, each must progress at his own pace. This is a, an insight that you can understand. Um, if you're reading through very quickly the beginning of Canto 12, you're going to miss I, I missed it so, uh, for many times that I reread it. But uh, Virgil here is hinting exactly at this type of spiritual insight. So at this point, our hero, who's been uh, hunched over all this time, just like Oderisi, he's drawing his body up again, erect. Uh, the, his stance more suitable, this is the stance most suitable to men. And yet the thoughts I thought were still submissive, bent, which is a great um, translation from the Kinati Eshemi. Uh, this also means to us that uh, Dante's redemption is coming near. We've uh, He's been reflecting and uh, living uh, uh, reflections about pride and humility about himself as well for all these three cantos, together with all the work he's been doing from the very beginning of the Commedia, and his redemption of the sin of pride is getting near. It is Virgil who points out to Dante that on the floor, as they are walking, there are some uh, on the pavement, in fact, just like on the lids of pavement tombs, there are stone effigies of what the buried were before, 
so that the debt may be remembered. Uh, there are some uh, carved, even more skillfully, some carved images and effigies um, on all the path protruding from the mountain. So we need to imagine this uh, path, which is the first terrace of uh, Purgatorio, which is paved with uh, sets of uh, carvings that are paired, so two by two by two. And uh, we don't know exactly their dimensions, but uh, I tend to imagine them pretty large and taking the entire space of, uh, of the path itself. Remembering the examples of uh, humility that Dante saw in Canto 10, Mary, uh, etc., which were on the, on the actual vertical side of, uh, of the path, here, we, here he, we say, I'm saying he doubles down because he really increases the number of the ekphrastic presentations, the artistic inventions. He's a poet as in, and he's inventing sculptures, which I love because these are imaginative sculptures that nobody will never know, but they are there and they are even possibly more beautiful because they are only in our imagination and in his imagination. A couple of things before going through them in the detail. These examples of the pride are sketches, are real sketches by a master, because the examples of humility were a little bit more articulated. Uh, in this case, Dante concedes only one tercet for each little sketch, and the way he does it is uh, so effective that uh, in only three lines, very short lines, he captures the essence of a complex scene. And in most cases, in the majority of cases, he's actually presenting us a myth or an event while it's uh, happening, rather than uh, after it's happened or in a static way. So it's much more dynamic. The second uh, point that is uh, pretty ex exciting, at least to me, it's uh, this spectacular acrostic that uh, Dante came up with. and. Uh, it's, it's an acrostic that's been uh, um, discovered and the commentators have been speaking about for the last uh, couple of hundred years, but not before. So it's interesting how even in the history of the comments to the Divine Comedy, there's been an evolution. In fact, uh, Teodorinda Barolini, who is the author of the Digital Dante website in, at Columbia University, she uh, says uh, a magnificent acrostic displays the 13 examples of pride almost visually. Letters are deployed as a kind of artwork. What are these letters? They are the first letter of each tertina, for, uh, starting with verse 25, for four tertinas, four tercets, letter V. Then we have four tercets starting with letter O, and then we have four tercets starting with letter M. Knowing and remembering that during the Middle Ages, the letters V and U were written the same way as a, as a V. What Dante is doing here is uh, putting in, in the background almost, in transparency, WOM, the, the, the word WOM, which means WOMO or man. So behind this uh, splendid canto that talks about pride, um, he has uh, painted as if he's painted uh, in transparency, uh, you just think about the Vitruvian Man by Leonardo. That's what he did, Dante, and uh, the meaning is immediate. You know, there is nothing that reflects our nature more than the sin of pride. It's so ingrained in our DNA, in what we are, in our essence, that you know, in this important canto about pride, Dante made sure that. Uh, uh, he re wanted to reinforce the fact that uh, it's the most human, uh, the, 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 the most important sin that we need to be careful about, pride. And when this uh, acrostic is uh, finished, um, at verse 61, he repeats it in just one tercet as a conclusion. Uh, the tercet in uh, verse number 61, we have V, O, M again in just one tercet. So, to almost uh, give us a, another hint of this. Here I think I should uh, applaud um, Robin Kirkpatrick, who in his translation of the Divine Comedy, in this canto, he, he actually went for it. He went for the acrostic uh, in English, and so we have um, 
letter M in the first four trattine, then letter A, and then letter N in the third uh, four trattine, spelling out the word man. Um, I like his uh, daring, the way he uh, really tried to imitate this game that Dante is playing. Mandelbaum doesn't do that. Mandelbaum simply goes with a, a good translation. Let's look at these sketches real quick. The first one is the easiest one, the, the one that we would uh, imagine that starts the procession of uh, terribly prideful um, characters, and is Lucifer, or Satan. I saw to one side of the path one who had been created nobler than all other beings, falling lightning-like from heaven. The Italian expression giù dal cielo folgoreggiando scende, it's uh, uh, mostly taken from the Gospel. So we have Lucifer there. Then uh, on the other side, and Dante is careful to tell us physically that the other, the next uh, scene is on the side of this first one, he saw Bri uh, Briareus transfixed by the celestial shaft. He lay ponderous on the ground in fatal cold, uh, the cold of, uh, of death. Briareus, uh, we already met him, in uh, Inferno 31, he was one of the giants, but in fact he was uh, de that particular giant who um, was an, the object of an amusing exchange between Dante and Virgil, uh, when uh, Virgil said to Dante, Virgil was trying to minimize the importance of, uh, of this particular giant, while Dante brought up the interest, his interest in seeing him. Why? Because Virgil had described in his writings Briareus as somebody with 50 arms, 100 heads, I believe, 50 heads and 100 arms. Uh, this kind of exaggerated description made Virgil a little uh, ashamed. In fact, he wrote about this exaggerated writing himself. And it's funny how Dante brings him up, brings him up in Canto 31 in front of a Virgil who minimizes and says, let's not go and, and look at the giant as if he was afraid that Dante will see that in fact the real Bri Briareus does not look at all like he described him. But he finally here uh, is able to see it, even if there's no specific description, but that's the, the giant. Then I saw uh, Tim Breus, I saw Mars and Pallas, still armed as they surrounded Joe, their father, gazing upon the giant's scattered limbs. This is still the same event in mythology, the giants who rebelled against uh, the gods of Olympus, against Jove, and this particular god, Timbreus, is the name for Apollo, Pallas is Minerva, and then we have Mars, who were surrounding Jove, and the example of pride here are the actual giants, who've been uh, destroyed in their body by Jove and his lightning, and so all that you can see in this uh, relief in this carving is pieces of their bodies, uh, their scattered limbs. Then I saw bewildered Nimrod at the foot of, this, of his great labor. Watching him were those of Shinar who had shared his arrogance. Uh, this from Shinar were those who helped Nimrod build the Tower of Babel on the plains of Shinar. So we are still in the Old Testament uh, territory and uh, Nimrod is another giant. Then oh, Niobe, what tears afflicted me when, on that path, I saw your effigy among your slaughtered children, seven and seven. She, Niobe was the wife of the king of Thebes, and she, according to the myth, she boasted that she was a better mother than Latona, who was the mother of Apollo and Diana. These two gods, um, as powerful and aggressive as they were, after hearing her, their mother being belittled, by Niobe, they decided to kill all 14 of her, chi of her children, of her kids, as uh, you used to do in those times and if you were a god. The Greek myths stories are so uh, pitiless sometimes and incredibly cruel. Oh, so you were portrayed there as one who had died in, on his own sword, Apolgiboa, this uh, story of Saul as an example of a prideful man. He is actually an example of a prideful suicide in this case because he was on the battlefield. Uh, he failed to keep God's commands and uh, afraid of being taken by the enemies, he decided to fall on his sword 
on the battlefield. So it's a suicide because of pride. Then David cursed the mountains around because the mountains were witness of this event. And uh, David asked the mountains that neither rain nor dew ever reached this uh, area. This is why, and it was an area in Samaria. This is why uh, Dante is saying upon Gilboa, which never after knew the rain, the dew. Again, uh, myths and, uh, or, and some biblical references here. Omed Arachne, we also see Arachne in Inferno as well. I saw you already have spider. See how the event is uh, in theory, in, during its uh, evolution and not the beginning or not the end, to make it more dynamic. Wretched on the ragged remnants of work that you had wrought um, to your own hurt. Then we have Rehoboam, you whose effigy seems not to menace there, and yet you flee by chariot, terrified, though none pursues. Uh, it's another peculiar story from the Old Testament. Uh, Rehoboam was the son of Solomon. Uh, he was chosen to become king of Israel. But he didn't accept uh, to lower the taxes. So out of the 12 tribes of Israel, 10 of them rebelled against him. And even if they didn't threaten him yet, at least, he wasn't under physical threat at all, he decided to run away, to flee on this chariot, even if no one was pursuing him. So this is uh, why Dante is saying, though none pursues, you're, uh, you're fleeing. It also showed the pavement of hard stone, how much Alcmeon made his mother pay, the cost of the ill-omened ornament where Alcmeon's mother, her name was Eryphil, she betrayed her husband for a necklace that belonged to a goddess. Uh, she was so enamored with this, uh, the beauty of this necklace and therefore the sin of pride. The pride was in thinking herself worthy of a necklace that belonged to a goddess. And she betrayed her husband and as a consequence, her son then decided to kill her, as usual, bloody, cruel, myths stories. The next one showed the children of uh, Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, one of the kings of Assyria, as they assailed their father in the temple. They left him dead behind them as they fled. Then he showed the slaughter and devastation wrought by Tomiris when she told the Cyrus, you thirst after blood, with blood I fill you. I like the Italian, sangue sitisti e io di sangue tempio. It's a legend, but uh, it's rooted in history because this is Cyrus the Elder that the legend is talking about when he attacked uh, a particular town in uh, um, the area where the Massageti used to live and Tomiris was the queen of this Massageti. Uh, they defeated Cyrus the Elder and uh, after the defeat, she decided to decapitate him and put his head in a vessel full of human blood. That's what you used to do at those in those times. Um, and finally, he showed the rout of the Assyrians sent reeling after Holofernes' death, and also showed his body what was left. This is uh, Holofernes, uh, he was an Assyrian general, ancient history, he was defeated and decapitated by, by the Jewish. Uh, that was the, the war between uh, the Assyrians and the Hebrews back then. Finally, in this tercet where Dante is using the three letters as uh, beginning of each line, U, O, and M, um, he talks about Troy. And Troy was uh, famous and popular even in the Middle Ages, but traditionally it's always been as uh, seen as uh, superb, as uh, arrogant, as a city. So he's not talking about a person here, but as the city of Troy, turned to caverns and to ashes. So we've seen these 13 effigies or carvings that represent uh, really sketches of pride or examples of pride. And uh, at the end of this uh, ekphrasis, like we saw in uh, Canto 10, Dante does the same, a similar thing, which is to remind us of the artistic concept behind it. And this is why he says, uh, what master of the brush or of the stylus had there protected such masses? Um, the dead seem dead and the alive, alive. It's uh, again the concept that being this uh, authored by the greatest artist, who is God, uh, 
they are not only uh, not different from reality, but they are better than anything that can be imagined. So the dead in the artistic um, work look actually dead, the alive look alive. And uh, I think, I'm sure if he had more time to write and more lines to write, he would have brought up again smells, perfumes, um, sounds, just like he did in Canto 10. This is so beautiful. It sounds almost like he liked writing Canto 10 so much and what he did there that he doubled down here in Canto 12. At verse 70, Dante says, Now, sons of evil, persist in arrogance, in haughty stance. Do not let your eyes bend, lest you be forced to see your evil path. It's uh, as, a rhetorical, as a rhetorical trope. This is called antiphrasis, and uh, Dante is using it quite often, in fact, as a sarcastic, in a sarcastic tone, um, especially when he is particularly uh, disappointed or angry towards uh, some human beings or, or some people in general. In this case, he is talking about people who persevere in their prideful ways, despite uh, pride being the poison to the soul that it is. Now, as I mentioned, this is the fourth time overall that I go through this canto, and even if I keep going back to the Divine Comedy, so it's difficult for me to count. And uh, I'm honest when I say that even this time, um, I've been, I felt like I've been learning, learning about myself, my flaws, and uh, probably my main sin being that of pride, which is the root of all sins, like uh, St. Thomas says. Um, what this tells me is that it's really insufficient to read about it, to understand the concept, um, unless you do the There is an ocean of difference between understanding the concept that pride is poison for your life and for your soul, and actually doing something about it, or try to cleanse your soul from pride, or at the very least, try to walk the path of humility, however you understand it. The best way to do it, as Dante teaches and as the Christian tradition teaches, is to stay in front of God as much as possible, meaning to pray, uh, to look inside, to take care of your soul, and to understand where these dysfunctional, prideful movements are coming from. And uh, since in these days I've been reading the wonderful, wonderful uh, interior castle, by St. Teresa. Uh, she was such a genius. It's almost like uh, I, I get the feeling uh, I'm reading about the Olympics of prayer because uh, she reached uh, some heights and peaks in, in uh, the art of praying that uh, not many people have been able to reach. And so she talks about it in a very candid and honest way. And when it comes to pride, she has a way to explain to us the practicality, in a very pragmatic way, what the entire point of Purgatorio is. Even if she's not expressly talking about Purgatorio, but since I'm reading both books at the same time, I can share with you, this is really the impression I'm getting. So she is making a couple of quick examples. The first one is this one. She says, uh, when it comes to trying to align your mind and heart to the will of God, what this means in practice is that uh, if you see somebody who is sick, for example, a sick sister in the monastery where uh, St. Teresa lived and worked, a sick sister, um, and you see, you see her and you, can, you know that you can relieve her or help her a little bit, it shouldn't make you feel minimally sorry that you can that you should leave whatever you're doing, maybe a devotion or a prayer, and go and help her. Inside your heart, you should um, even, for example, relent your own uh, food and go and help her. And this should give you only joy. In other words, it's not enough to do it. The good behavior is great. But uh, to have your heart and mind aligned with God would mean that you feel inside you joy in doing it. You feel that it, because it's the right thing to do, you, you don't feel any type of um, annoyance even at the thought of doing it. And um, this is incredibly insightful, I find, even if it may sound a little banal, but uh, 
I see myself completely reflected in this. Whenever I try to do something that is uh, good, that is uh, clearly the right thing to do, but inside myself, uh, I still have a little bit of grumbling. And uh, I realize, thanks to Dante and thanks to Saint Teresa, that that grumbling in itself is wrong. The grumbling in itself, interior grumbling, is something that uh, spiritually, Purgatorio would help me purify of. Uh, I find this uh, such an important concept. Then Virgil and Dante see this uh, angel, the angel of humility. There is a structure right that will repeat in every terrace where the angel of the specific virtue opposite to the sin will appear and uh, cleanse Dante of the P on his forehead that represents that specific sin. The sixth of the hours of the morning. So he talks about uh, the hours of the morning as the handmaids of uh, the day. And this means that it's noon in this moment, in the day. The description of the angel is at verse 88. Um, however, I don't know if Mandelbaum is uh, doing the best he could here in describing, in translating the description of the angel, because he says his clothes were white, and in, in his aspect, he seemed like the trembling star that rises in the morning, which is beautiful, very beautiful. But Dante kind of lasers in the, the angel's face rather than his general aspect. And Dante says uh, the, the angel was bianco vestito, which is just one word to say dressed in white. E nella faccia, the face, quale par tremolando matutina stella. So this trembling star is Dante's metaphor, but he uses it only for the visage, for the face of the angel. So there is a little bit of difference here. Very interesting, the, at verse 94, this invitation answered by so few, O humankind, born for the upward flight. It's a crucial verse in the entire canto. Dante says, O gente umana, per volar su nata, perché a poco vento così cadi? We are born to fly, spiritually, in our spiritual potential, we have the potential to fly. And yet, it's only a little something, a little gust of wind that uh, makes us fall and go back to our usual ways and our usual habits. Dante describes the physicality of this passage that's been indicated by, by the angel. He mentions uh, this uh, church, which is the church of San Miniato al Monte. I'm going to show it because uh, it's a very beautiful place and a church. And uh, the, this Rubaconte is a bridge over the Arno River, today called the uh, Ponte alle Grazie, marvelous uh, architecture and, and marvelous uh, touristic destination for many. Really, really beautiful. There is a criticism towards Florence and towards political corruption here from Dante. Florence, where Dante calls it the well-ruled city, that's pure sarcasm. Um, and uh, when he says uh, when record books could be trusted because today, in Dante's time, the civil authorities have become so corrupt, they cannot be trusted anymore. While we began to move in that direction, Beati Pauperes Spiritu was sung so sweetly. It's the first beautiful beatitude out of the Sermon on the Mount in both Matthew and Luke in the Gospels. And it reflects really the concept of humility as opposed to pride. Something that might be a little bit confusing is uh, the fact that Dante has structured Purgatorio with seven terraces and therefore seven sins and seven Beatitudes, while the Beatitudes in the Sermon on the Mount are actually eight. Dante is following St. Thomas. St. Thomas had wrote that the Beatitudes were seven by conflating a couple of them into one, still using all the Beatitudes of the Sermon on the Mount, but uh, using the number seven to describe them. That's why Dante is using seven as well. But I seemed to be much more light than I had been before along the level terrace. This is another really, really fascinating concept. It's uh, like many other things, but uh, really it's a factual truth. The fact that in your spiritual journey, something that St. Teresa talks about as well in her interior castle, in the different um, mansions of the castle, how... Uh, just like a skyrocket when it's leaving Earth, it needs the most power to detach itself from the force of gravity that is strongest at the level of Earth. Then the farther away it gets from uh, the surface of Earth, 
the easier it is and the less power it's needed to fly away. It's uh, the same principle. Uh, Dante recognizes that, and that's also the reason why once he's being able to be cleansed of the P of, 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 for pride, the other ones are starting to get a little faint as well, because there is a relation to all the other sins. So it's not that they are separated in boxes, but they all interrelated. In fact, it's actually Virgil, the one who explains this concept here at verse 121. When the peace that still remain upon your brow, now almost all are faint, have been completely like this pea erased, your feet will be so mastered by good, goodwill that they not only will not feel travail, but will delight when they are urged uphill. We will find that after getting to Eden, the Garden of Eden, Dante, together with Beatrice, will be able to fly with her. Uh, this lightness is a physical in, is a physical description, but it reflects a certain um, feeling of lightness that uh, can be experienced during a spiritual journey when uh, the hard work is, is done. In any case, we need to remember that uh, Dante expected or assumed that he would uh, go back here after his death and uh, have to purify himself uh, from the sin of pride, just like the other ones with the carrying the rock, etc. That's what we are brought to conclude or understand. But uh, for the purposes of his travel, of his journey, the P is uh, uh, cleansed away. And here we have the conclusion of this canto, which I love. It's so simple, but it's extremely beautiful. Um, you know, at this point, uh, just imagine how long Dante has been living with this uh, imagined character of Virgil, and for the first time allows him to turn around and smile at him with a beautiful, beautiful smile without any type of explanation or articulation because it's not needed. It's uh, pure joy at seeing that uh, his pupil, his follower, is uh, progressing. He's progressing in a way that uh, he will never be able to progress, but he is, in fact, joyful for him. Thank you again and very much for watching this video. It's uh, one of the best, one of the very best cantos. Um, I would uh, really sit in front of a jury and uh, argue this point. This is one of the very best cantos of the Divine Comedy for many, many reasons. Uh, and I hope you liked it. So, and I hope this uh, was uh, useful information. Thank you again.